Well, good morning. Great to see everybody here this morning. Allow me to begin uh, this message off by asking a couple of questions. I like asking questions to start. I think it gets us thinking a little bit. Is it annoying to you when you may be waiting for a phone call for somebody or waiting for a, a message from a friend and then you finally see your phone's ringing and you check and on the phone screen you see warning potential spam? Is that an annoying thing for anybody else? I feel like I've been getting a lot more of those phone calls recently, warning potential spam. Or do you ever feel on edge when you may be going somewhere and somebody's interested in selling you a product and they're talking with you about it, they're going through this product that they're trying to sell you? Do you ever feel hesitant about that? Do you almost feel like you can't trust them fully? You almost feel like they're not telling you the full truth? I know some of you do because there's been certain times when I have reached out to some of you in a phone call and you didn't have my phone number. That's totally fine. But I reach out to you with a phone call and I say, hello, is this so-and-so? And you go, yes. <laughs> you seem very cautious. Some of you are laughing explicitly. You remember this conversation I had with you. But then I, once I say, oh, this is Preston from Calvary, you go, oh. Okay, which means I appreciate the fact that you like me more than a potential spam person. I appreciate that. I really, really do. And I bring all of that up because we are surrounded in many different ways by half-truths. We're surrounded by people and by positions and places and mindsets that, that are trying to sell us something but aren't trying to tell us all of the facts. They aren't trying to tell us all the things that are happening. They're, you know, you, you hear somebody saying the good things, and the, the thing that you have in the back of your mind is, yeah, but what's the catch? You know, there's good stuff, but where's the bad? Where, where, where do I, am I going to get hurt from this? Many times I've heard folks both in this room and abroad just simply say that I just want to know all of what's going on. I don't care if it's good. I don't care if it's bad. If I know what I'm working with, I feel better equipped to handle the situation that I am in. I just want somebody to tell me all of it, if that includes the good and the bad. Well, what I want to tell you this morning is that somebody does. Somebody is willing to tell us all of the benefits and the costs of what it means to take part in what they are giving to us, and that somebody is God. And the thing that I want to talk about this morning is that in a world that we cannot trust, in a world full of, yeah, but what's the catch? God is willing, and God does tell us all, all of the good and the bad and provides evidence for both. In a world that we cannot trust, God provides all of the good and the bad and the evidence for both. So that we know all of what we are working with, all of what it costs for us to follow God, all of what we get out of it, and all of what is difficult about it. And so that's what we're going to go through this morning. We're going to learn what are the benefits, what are the blessings that God gives us by following him, and what are the costs. That's what I want to go through this morning. And the way that we're going to do that is by opening up your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter. So if you have your Bibles, please open them to the book of 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 1. We're going to cover verses 3 through 12. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. To provide a little bit of information, if, for those of you that um, weren't able to hear a few weeks ago, Pastor John, as he mentioned, introduced the First Peter book and talk a little bit about it and talk about the theme that we're going to be seeing throughout the entirety of the book. If you haven't seen that message, I very much encourage you to go back at some point and either listen to it or watch it. We have it on our website and podcasts and all sorts of different, on our Facebook page, all sorts of different stuff. But in that message, Pastor John mentioned the central theme working through First Peter, and that that is holy living in the midst of suffering. Holy living in the midst of suffering. And this passage is not excused from that. This passage sums that up very well, is that their holy living and suffering are sometimes and many times frustratingly intertwined. You can't have one without the other. If you only have one without the other, you are not truly 
following God's plan or what God presents in Scripture. And so this passage talks about that. And the first part of this passage talks about the blessings, the great highs in life that we get from following God. And that starts, that's going to be in verses 3 through 5. Please read these verses with me. Verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. These few verses very well encapsulate the great blessings that folks have should they choose to follow God, should they choose to trust in God and and be led by God. These blessings here are, are, are incredible, and it's easy to read over them by just seeing words that we've read a million times when we've read our Bibles or we've heard other Christians or other people mentioning them. Let's break them down a little bit. Verse three, we're gonna take each verse in its own bit. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter, the author of this book, does not waste any time talking about how the first and greatest blessing that God offers those that are willing to follow him is the gospel message itself. This verse very well encapsulates several different parts of the gospel. The first thing it encapsulates is what I think is the way that God, the way that God comes to us. We live in a world where you have to go out and work hard in order to be successful by this world's standards. But according to God, God comes to us. Verse 3, it says that according to God's great mercy, God has caused us to be born again. Born again. Those are some words that are used a lot of different times in the scriptures. Specifically in the New Testament, Jesus used these words often. Peter here uses these words. John the Apostle writes these words. They're very common words, but what do they actually mean? What does that actually mean to be born again? What are they talking about here? Well, this term, being born again, another word that we like to use for it, for those of you that like your big words, another word that we like to use for it and what theologians will often call it is something called regeneration. Regeneration. And and this is a very tricky thing to understand, a very tricky term to understand. And so my most basic definition of when somebody is regenerated is that it's when we gain a new level of understanding who we are and how much we need God. The Bible tells us that because of our sin and the things that we do wrong, we are eternally separated from God, and with that would suffer a punishment apart from God because of the evil that we have done. We have no way, no reason, no desire to come back to God because of our sinful nature, the things that we do that are wrong, the things that we do that are evil. But according to this doctrine of of regeneration, we don't go out and find God. God comes and he finds us. I was trying to think of an illustration to help sort of describe regeneration. And the best thing that I could come up with, even with its own flaws, is that light bulb moment. You know that? You know if you've watched a cartoon or seen a TV show or a movie and there's that moment where somebody's trying to figure something out and then then they're thinking, they're thinking, and then they go, oh, I got it, and the light bulb goes off. In many ways, that describes this moment of regeneration. Regeneration is that moment when that light bulb goes off and I go, wow, I am a sinner. I'm going to be punished for that. And I need God to save me. The only difference between that light bulb moment on TV and this moment of regeneration 
is that in that light bulb moment, the character, the person figures it out themselves. They go, oh, I got it. Whereas for regeneration, we don't figure it out. We don't come to the conclusion ourselves. God reveals it to us. God is the one that turns on the light bulb. If anything, we are hindering rather than turning it on our, ourselves. As I said, in a world that we have to go out and work hard in order to do things, God comes down. God is known as the God who, who stoops down to our level. He, he is in heaven and he is holy and he is powerful and he is wonderful, but he has decided to stoop down to our level, most notably through Jesus Christ living on this earth. And, and then he, when he comes down, he shows us how much we need him. Now, regeneration is something that has happened. If you are a Christian and you have had a, a moment that you believed in Jesus, turned from your sins and trusted in Christ to forgive you of your sins, you've had this moment before. You might even think back to your own testimony and think of that time that it clicked for you. You might think of that time of, oh my gosh, this, this person either is giving a message or I, maybe I'm in a, a kid's ministry or maybe my friend is sharing with me the gospel or, or whatever else and, I, and I, I don't understand, but I just know that I need Jesus. That is your moment of regeneration. It's different for different people. It's a mystery, completely under the control of the work of God, bringing to us a realization of how much we need him. He has caused us to be born again. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The final part of this work points to the, the verse, points to the very work of Jesus himself, giving us this hope that is living, that is alive, that will never, that will not die, and that is specifically focused in the death of our God, who by his death offers us an opportunity to have our sins forgiven, to believe in God once again or to believe in God and to have a relationship with God. That's what this verse is, is talking about. That's the first blessing that God gives us, is God gives us himself. And we're only in verse 1 of this passage. Continuing on, verses 4 and 5, please read those with me. Talking about a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So one of God's blessings he gives us is, 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 a, is an understanding of offering of salvation, and from that salvation comes an inheritance that we will receive not on this earth, not in this life. But God promises us that when we go through physical death, when, when our bodies die, because we believe in God, we are then ushered into the presence of God where, where we live in existence in a life free from evil, free from sin, free from heartbreak. It's an inheritance. Some of you might have ever had an inheritance. Some of you might be handing down an inheritance to somebody. An inheritance that I'm getting, and I, I believe it's an inheritance, is actually from my grandfather. He's always talked to me how when I get my own place and have my own stuff, he's given me a set of tools to be able to have. I don't know how expensive tools are, but I really will appreciate it once I find out how expensive they are. But he has said that once when I have my own space, I can have my own tools to work on my cars or do whatever and learn about how to fix and build and stuff. I'm still kind of learning it all. But that's something that he is handing down to me, and, and I'm very appreciative of it. And I have to be very careful because he's in the room today. So, <laughs> love you, Grandpa. But the difference between that inheritance and the inheritance that God's word provides for us is that those tools, as great as they are, it doesn't matter when they were made, how they were made, who they were made by, they are perishable. They are fading. They are, they could be destroyed. They could be ruined. There could be a fire in my grandpa's barn tonight, if there is. That's really creepy that I just thought of that. But there could be, and those tools could be ruined. 
It's an inheritance. I'm looking forward to it, but I cannot have full certainty and assurance that I'm going to receive them. The promise that God offers us is completely assured. It is unfading. It is undefiled. It is imperishable. How? Well, verse 5. It says that by God's power, it is being guarded. Once you believe in Jesus, God has an inheritance for you that you will be able to, once you die on this earth and and are present with God, live in existence free from sin as we wait for the, the, the second resurrection of our Lord. And that is something that will never go away because it is God himself who is protecting it. The creator of the universe, the creator of all evil forces that might be able to get rid of it, only God can properly protect it. God will always hold up his end of the bargain. It is a true living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's not a dying hope. It is a continuous living hope that God offers us. What incredible blessings. What incredible blessings does God offer us and that God offers you? And if you don't know if you would receive those blessings today, my encouragement for you is to ask yourself the question, do I believe in Jesus to pay for my sins? Have I believed in the name of Jesus to forgive me of my sins? If not, then this inheritance is not for you at this point. But but there is an opportunity for you even today to believe in this gospel message, to receive these blessings, to receive the the greatest gifts that we could ever receive in life. For further questions on this, please talk to a, a friend that may have invited you or a family member that you know that might be a Christian or even talk to one of us uh, deacons or pastors after the service. Now, we started this, le- this, this message talking about salesmen and feeling kind of sketchy about it and never feeling fully comfortable with it, feeling like they're not telling us the whole truth. And for some of those pitches, this conversation would end right here. It's all great. It's all good. It's all wonderful. But God doesn't end here. Because as, as, as amazing and as blessing-wise and, and as wonderful as the promises that God gives us in his word are, there is also great cost. Life isn't perfect, or I might not even, not even know if it's easier once you've believed in Jesus. In the next parts of this passage, we go from the greatest highs, the greatest blessings, the greatest benefits to the deepest and lowest of, of lows, the cost. This is the hard part. Verses 6 through 9. Please, please read them with me. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor At the revelation of Jesus Christ, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Again, we would be foolish to read over this and not truly understand what's happening in this passage And specifically, when we look at verse 6, it's a very ambiguous statement. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. You have been grieved by various trials. That's an ambiguous phrase. That doesn't tell me anything. I have no idea what Peter is, is talking about. We've been grieved by various trials. What does that mean? Well... In order to understand what that means, we have to learn a little bit about some of the extra-biblical historical events that were happening when this book was written. And with that, allow me to introduce to you a Roman emperor by the name of Nero. 
If you know who Nero is, you just got a tightening in your stomach. If you don't know who Nero is, you're like, who in the world is this guy? Nero, or as many people might call him today, the mad emperor, was the leader of the Roman Empire when first Peter was written. And for those of us that may look around in the world today or in our country today and perhaps seem like it's, it's, it's pretty bad with world leaders or governmental leaders or that it's as, it's as bad as it's going to get, well, you need to learn a little bit about Nero. Of the many different empi- emperors that the Roman Empire had, Nero was one of the worst. There is an argument back and forth between Nero and another emperor named Caligula, who actually was the emperor before Nero, as the church was starting. The church was starting under what history recognizes as the worst emperors in all of the history of the Roman Empire. To get a little bit of information about Nero, just to give a little bit of an understanding of who he is, and I'm not sharing all of the story. There's a lot of different things that he he did that I don't think I would like to share in a public place like this. So if you're interested, look it up on Google at your own discretion. But one of the things that he was known for contributing to directly was one of the great fires that burned down the capital city of the Roman Empire called Rome. Nero was psychotic in his understandings of being a leader, and he looked around his empire, and and he looked around his city, and he came to the conclusion that he didn't like how old it looked. He didn't like the way that it looked, and he knew of this little bitty, it wasn't a big thing, but it was this little bitty weird sect coming off of Judaism where people are being called Christians and they're believing in this guy that says that that Jesus is Lord. And so Nero decides he doesn't like that because in the Roman Empire, nobody else is Lord, but Caesar is Lord. The emperor is God. There's other gods and they can be there, they can exist, but Caesar alone is Lord. And so Nero decided to get two birds with one stone by being the direct propagator of sending people out to burn down his own capital city and and in, in the process killing hundreds of thousands of people so that A, the city could be remodeled to look better, and B, he could blame it on the Christians and the Jews and enact the first Roman systematic persecution of Christians and, to an extent, as well, Jews. And so for the first time in the church's history, it had an empire-wide persecution death sentence set against it. You have been grieved by various trials. Persecution, a definition of a majority group attacking, imprisoning, and and torturing, and even killing a religious minority group. That's the simplest definition of persecution. And what might that have looked like? Well, here is a fairly famous painting. The painting is called The Christian Martyr's Last Prayer by, and I'm going to mispronounce this name, I don't know French, Jean-Leon Jerome. Forgive, for, forgive me if you know French. But for those of you that may not be able to fully see all that's happening up here, allow me to continue to describe what's going on. Is that this was set in what is called the Colosseum. It still exists today and is still there today. You know it's the Colosseum in Rome because above it there is these hills where it looks like there's a statue and various temples up there, most notably the temple to the god Jupiter, who was the Roman version of the Greek god Zeus. Greco-Roman religions were very intertwined. Almost standing at this level of hierarchical, like superiority, looking down upon this meager group of, of people who are huddled down and praying, and one older gentleman is standing and praying. These are known as the Christians. This Colosseum is filled with hundreds of thousands of Romans that that came out for entertainment like they're going to a baseball game. 
And if you haven't noticed, obviously, yet, the lion coming out and underneath the traps there is also other various wild animals who, note, would have been starved multiple days so that they were extra ferocious and would put on a better show. And one other addition to this is if you look in the back and you see the torches, those are actually crucifixes. And those are people. You have been grieved by various trials. This is what Peter was talking about. These are the various trials. And I want to mention something else while we we keep this picture up there for a while. I want to mention something else because I feel like even us today, we live in a situation very separated from what many of our brothers and sisters in Christ have encountered throughout the course of history. We live in a country that isn't doing this to Christians. We live in a place that we really don't have fear of something to this degree. And so it's easy for us to separate out into, at this point, we all are, I mean physically, but in some way, even metaphorically, look up to these Christians and say, wow, those guys, those guys are strong Christians. They're willing to die for their faith. I wish I could do that one day. I hope that maybe one day, if if something like that would ever happen, I hope that I could do this. Well, I think Pastor John mentioned this in his intro to 1 Peter, but I'd like to mention it again. As we look at this as sort of the end goal of what it means to be a strong Christian, is willing to suffer to this degree. But these, these Christians, they're not any crazier any more spiritual, any stronger, any different than any of us. The same calling to suffer that this passage suggests that was given to them is given to us. The same calling to die for your faith, to endure hardships, to endure sacrifices, unfair sacrifices is the same exact thing that we are called to do that they were called to do. We can't keep looking at these guys like they're our own superhero club. They're not superheroes. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are called to the exact same thing. Now, for us, it looks different, right? You have been grieved by various trials. On the one hand, we looked at the beginning of this passage. There was great blessing and great joy, and I was hearing amens that I was hearing. You guys were, were, were about it. You're like, yes, let's go. I haven't heard many amens when I've been talking about this part. This is just as much a promise for us as salvation was, as the inheritance was, as the assurance was, just as much of a promise. We can't be surprised when it happens. We cannot. So that's promise number one. Promise number two. Verse seven. We encounter or are grieved by various trials, verse seven, so that for the purpose of the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We encounter various trials for the purpose of our faith becoming purer, stronger, better, more trusting in the same way, and then this illustration that Peter uses is of gold, you know, you, you mine gold out of the ground, and it's, 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 it's a piece of metal with rocks and, and all sorts of other things, and it's a natural thing that comes out of the earth, and then you put it into a furnace, and then the furnace melts off, the, melts the gold, and as it melts the gold, the, the, the hard rocks either, either sink to the bottom or they go out of the way so that you can sift that out, and the gold is left stronger, purer, more valuable. 
And in the same way, we go through sufferings so that our faith turns out stronger, purer, more valuable. We're quick to ask God when things don't go our way, ask him why. And there's, that's a complicated question. Why, God? Why does this have to happen? This is one of the reasons. We, we talk about wanting to know God more. We talk about wanting to grow closer to him. But when it, it becomes uncomfortable, it, it hurts, and, and we get cautious, and we get on edge, and we, we question, is this really what God wants me to do? But according to this passage, according to this verse, the way to grow closer to God is through the furnace. The way to grow closer to God is through the furnace. We cannot be surprised when we encounter difficulties in life. Our theology of suffering needs to be brought to a point that when difficulties happen, we need to be able to look at that and not only expect it, but be able to say, God, help me through this. I know that you are working in this. Even God's the most beautiful thing in the universe and all of outside of creation. Only God could turn something as horrible as this and somehow bring good out of it. You have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Friends, don't ever think that when suffering happens or suffering comes your way or various trials are in your life, don't ever think you, you're, you're doing something wrong. We live in a comfort culture that when I feel uncomfortable, something's wrong. According to Scripture, something's not wrong. But in fact, you're growing. So we have our blessings, and we have our costs. We will encounter various trials. And the way to grow closer to Christ is through the furnace, not getting around it, not getting away from it, not trying to to push the flames or, or douse the flames with a little bit of comfort that we can manage in our own resources and expenses, but through the furnace. We cannot be surprised. Verses 8 and 9 say this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Think of, again, who's writing this book? Peter. Think of what Peter's life has looked like. Think of what his life has looked like, and as he's writing this to his brothers and sisters, he's saying that you Christians, you've never seen this Jesus, but you believe in him. You don't now see him, yet your joy is inexpressible. We can't explain the joy that you have in a God that you've never seen face to face. Peter's perspective is different. Peter walked with Jesus. Peter talked with Jesus. Peter had breakfast with Jesus. Peter was confronted by Jesus on several occasions. Peter was able to sit at the feet of God himself. And he's showing them this this tension of you've not seen this God face to face. You're believing in something that, that, that by earthly terms, by human terms, seems to defy logic. Seems to defy all human understandings. And Peter's not advocating for a blind faith. He's not saying just believe in something you can't see, but, but he's saying that you won't see this Jesus until you appear with him in heaven. And you might see different ways in life that he works or different relationships come into play that that bring about his glory and you can point at something and say, God did that. You could point at stuff. God did that. God did that. God did that. God definitely did that. But you won't see him like I can see you. What kind of a cost is that? 
This God tells you you're going to suffer. This God tells you the only way to learn more about him is to suffer, to sacrifice. And this God tells you, and you won't see him face to face. What a calling. What a hard teaching. But that's the paradox here. Because while they don't see him, they rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What a beautiful tension that by not seeing God, we we don't see him face to face like we may see each other, you and I today, but there is a level of joy that we can have in him that defies human understanding. That defies the logic that anybody could present to us today. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation for your souls. These are the costs. This is your calling. We continue, verses 10 through 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. Peter provides the blessings of following God. Peter provides the cost of following God. And Peter provides the evidence for these claims. Looking back to the ministry of the prophets in the Old Testament, looking back to the writings of of the word of God. The Christians in this time didn't have the New Testament. Remember, this, this was a letter. They had the Old Testament. You know that part of the Bible that we have trouble understanding and always remembering what it says? The prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, the, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all these different parts of the Old Testament was, 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 was the prophets realizing in their time that that information God was giving to them wasn't for them, but was for the Christians, was for those after the Messiah came, which means it was for these guys, and, and, to, and to an extent that was for us as well. Because this evidence that God provides is found in his word, is found in God working through the different steps of history to provide us with the revelation of God. You know, we we think and we ask, we say, God, would you just tell me what you want me to do? God has revealed what he wants us to do. Probably not to the degree that you may be asking, but he has revealed what he wants you to do. Is it specific to your own unique situation? Maybe not. But God also didn't write the Bible just for you. God has provided evidence for his claims. God has shown us not just the benefits and the cost, but he's shown us that he's been setting this up for thousands of years before the the foundation of the world. God knew what we needed. And he has given us what we needed in his word. So what do we do with all this information? We started this message talking about how we wish people would just tell us the whole truth. We just wish that they would just tell us the way it is. Help me to just know what to deal with, know what to handle. Well, God has done that, right? God has shown us the blessings. God has shown us salvation through Christ alone. God stooping down and revealing himself to us so that we can believe in him. And from that, get an inheritance that will never go away because it is guarded by the creator of the universe. We've heard of the, the blessings that God's given us, but we've also heard of the cost. You will encounter difficulties and sufferings. 
And if you ever want to grow towards God, you've got to hurt along the way. You've got to sacrifice. You won't always see God face to face. You may see different ways that he's working through the courses of people and events, but you you won't see him like Peter saw him. And the way we know this is because it's found in his word that God gave to us perfectly over the course of thousands of years. Many different authors, many different cultures, God brought it all together perfectly for us today. You have the whole truth. The question is, are you willing to do it? Are you willing to do it?